My family's lived there forever. In fact, I didn't know how long um, my family had lived there, but I'll get to that in a minute. So my father um, took my brother. My brother Paul's an oral surgeon. He's five years old at night. And my father took my brother Paul and me up to the casket to pay his respects to, um, to his father. And I had never been that close to a casket. So I was terrified. Right? I was holding daddy's hand. And I looked at, at my grandfather. And my grandfather, I thought, looked ridiculous. Um, my grandfather was looked like a white man. He was so white, we called him Casper behind his back. <laughs> <laughs> he would have killed us if he, if he <laughs> So if he was that white with blood coursing through his veins, imagine how white he looked dead. <laughs> he looked like he had been coated with alabaster and sprinkled with baby powder, right? So I thought the undertaker had made him ridiculously white. And I'm holding daddy's hand, and I heard this noise, and I thought my father was giggling at how ridiculously white. I know it sounds stupid, but I thought my father was giggling at how ridiculously white the undertaker had made his father. Now, why would I think that? Because my father... Um, the funniest man uh, who walked on the face of the earth. My father made Red Fox look like an undertaker. <laughs> I would tell you how funny my father was. When I was growing up, I wanted to go to Harvard and Yale, and I wanted to go to um, Oxford and Cambridge, because I was told that smart people went to Harvard and Yale, and then Oxford and Cambridge. So I went to Yale. And I've always been lucky in the class, blessed as my people our people would say in the classroom. And um, so I applied. I was junior Phi Beta Kappa. I was going to graduate summa cum laude. And so I decided I was going to apply for every possible fellowship that would take me to Oxford or King. Rhodes Scholarship, Fulbright, a Marshall, Casey, whatever. Now, um, I was it, certainly in the top two. father to share the joke. He was crying. You know, he was weeping. Um, to see his father, you know, paying his respect to his father. So I was so mortified, ladies and gentlemen. I thought my life was over because um, all the all the colored people, as we would say, uh, in Cumberland, Maryland, were there because my grandfather was a proper man in, in the community. But nobody even noticed me uh, because they were so astonished to see the funny man, my dad, crying. So I I was so humiliated. I started to cry too, right? And Daddy looked down. He, Tap me, and he didn't know what a, a jerk I had. <laughs> I was stupid, I'd been like laughing, right? So then we went to the Episcopal, the gates of the Episcopal, uh, went to the Episcopal Cemetery, which integrated Rose Hill Cemetery in Cumberland. And we buried all the gates are buried there. And we buried the pop gates. And then we came back to the Gates family home on Green Street, which was um, purchased the first of our homes. There was purchased by Jane Gates in 1870, but I'll come back to that in a minute. So um, we go into people in, in town. Piedmont had about 2,000 residents the year I was born, 1950. Half Irish, half Italian, and then a handful of black people. Um, and because Daddy worked two jobs, we always had a really nice house. And I had my own room. My brother had his own room. I had a bookcase and I had a desk. And on the desk. Next to my bed sat one of those old fashioned, now red Webster's dictionaries. And the last thing I did before I went to bed was look up the word estimable <laughs> because I didn't know what it meant. And then I thought, wow, that funny looking lady's estimable. Maybe I'm estimable too. <laughs> the next day was July 3rd. Now, our town, Brown v. Boards, 1954, our town, our county, in the great schools in eastern West Virginia in 1955 without Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. Um, people often ask me why um, West Virginia is not thought of as a really liberal place. But I, I think the people there are really good and decent people. And also, they're obsessed with basketball. So even a racist would figure out. <laughs> so the basketball team definitely was going to improve if they had a great <laughs> <laughs> so, but though the school was integrated, and all things social, as Booker T. Weiss said, it was separate. So we had a color picnic and a wake. So went to the color picnic, and on the way back, I asked Daddy, 
to stop at Red Bull's newsstand. It was like a convenience store. And buy me a notebook. He bought me a notebook. And that night, on July 3rd, 1960, in front of our 12-inch black and white television, I interviewed my parents about what only years later I would learn is called your family tree or your genealogy. Because I wanted to know how I could have this, these features um, be my color, the thickness of my lips, the shape of my nose, and be descended from a guy so white he looked like a ghost. And, <laughs> and then how his grandmother could be clearly of um, African descent. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't have a language for this, ladies and gentlemen. It was just instinct. But that's where my uh, love of genealogy uh, was born. Now, I would lose that notebook. I was only nine. And a couple of years would pass, and I would lose it. And I would look for it, couldn't find it. I'd buy another notebook. And I would interview my parents in front of them. TV would grow, you know, and uh, it just finally would become color. And I'd say, Daddy, tell me again how. He'd say, God damn it, boy, I told you. <laughs> I'd say, yeah, yeah. And then, cut to 1977. What's the biggest thing in history of television? Roots. So you could say, after 1977, I had a bad case of roots envy, right? I wanted to be like Alex Haley and know um, what village, what ethnic group I was descended from on the African continent. Uh, but only Alex Haley could do that, right? So cut to the year 2000, and I get a letter from a black geneticist at Howard University, Dr. Rick Kittles. And he said, a snail mail letter, yeah, Rick's a good guy. And he said, dear Dr. Gates, have you ever seen Roots? And I was like, what kind of idiot is this guy? <laughs> and I kept reading. And he said, well, we can now do what Alex Haley did in a laboratory in a test tube. And I'm looking for volunteers. He had no idea that I had this history of a passionate interest in genealogy. And I called him on the phone. And I was at Howard. And by this time, I was at Harvard. And I said, Dr. Kittles, you don't know him, but I'm your man. You know, I want to know my roots. I've been fascinated since I was nine years old. I will pay for you to fly in Boston. And he did. Came to my house, explained how the DNA worked. And um, and that time, at that time, as many of you know, you just spit in a test or swab your cheek. That's Regina, Sister Knight. Um, but at that time, to get sufficient tissue, they had to take blood. And so I put up with that. <laughs> you know, I almost decided I didn't want to have my Kunta Kinte moment. Because <laughs> it hurt. <laughs> the guy was taking my blood. Knew a lot about DNA, but he didn't know a lot about extracting blood. <laughs> so I waited six months. I didn't get any response from Ray Kittles. I would call his lab. Finally, a friend of mine said, um, call from another phone. <laughs> <He's> not, <laughs> so I went, wow, maybe he's not ducking me, you know. So I did that. I borrowed a friend's cell phone, and I dialed Rick Kittles' lab, and he answered right away. He said, Rick Kittles. <laughs> and I said, Rick, this is Kim Gates. He said, oh, man, I was just about to call you. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, Rick. Where am I from in Africa? Who are my people? And he said, well, that's why it took so long to get your results. Because your results are so anomalous. And I go, yeah, where am I from? And he said, you are descended from the Nubian people. Now, all black people want to be descended from the Zulus or the Nubians. The Zulu people, Chaka Zulu, took the spear, which was used as a weapon like that, and turned it to make a weapon like that. And revolutionized warfare. And he was a bad, bad brother. Um, and the Nubian people, they were the black pharaohs of the Nile. 25th dynasty was a black dynasty in the history of Egypt between 750 BC and 650 BC. And um, there's no doubt about it, they created statues, they painted them black. So you want to be, you know, want to be proud of Nubia. Nubia was the rival. All of Egypt, Egypt got all of its gold from Nubia. So they were rival kingdoms right up the Nile. And Nubia ran from Khartoum to the Aswan Dam. Okay, and then Egypt was, was above. So Rick said, 
We have tested 2,000 people by now, and you're the only person that we've tested who has, a, you're of Nubian descent. And you know, that fit with my ego, right? <laughs> I'm a Nubian prince, man. <laughs> Malefi and Sati, one it was like a friendly rival, right? Malefi was dying to be Nubian, but he's not. I said, eat your heart out. Eat your heart out. I am descended from the Pharaoh, baby. <laughs> There's only one problem then with both of those fantasies. And Oprah, when I did, I did, I tested Oprah, and she went to South Africa. She was with Mandela, 75,000 people, when she was announcing that she was going to do her school. Right. She said she'd just taken the DNA test and she was pleased to announce the result that she was descended from the Zulu people. I'm watching this in my study at home and thought, oh my God, you know, and then CNN, you know, they do news flash and say, Oprah Winfrey, Zulu. <laughs> I said, damn. So I called Rick and said, Rick, did you tell Oprah she was Zulu? He said, no. So you know what I did? I said, is anybody in your lab? He said, no. I said, Make her a zoo. <laughs> <laughs> no African American Zulu. Because no Zulu people came to the United States in the slave trade. And no African American is descended from the Nubian people. How are you going to get from Khartoum over to Ghana or Nigeria or Senegal? What, but my ancestor what, walked across the equator, went to get a free ride in Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> to pick cotton. <laughs> I look stupid, you guys. <laughs> but he gave me my certificate of new, new, Nubianality, and I framed it. I gave it to my best friend, Anthony Apia, who is an African prince. His uncle was the Asatahini, the king of the Asante people in Ghana. And he, he looked at him and he said, What a ton of rubbish. <laughs> and I said, You're just jealous, man. You're just jealous. <laughs> and it was, it was dubious, but hey. That's what DNA said. Okay. Then, in 2003, and I framed it, and I still have that letter from Rick Kittles, um, I got up, not to be indelicate, but I got up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. And I was standing in my bathroom, and when I walked in the bathroom, and then I had this idea. But I was standing in the bathroom, and I of nothing. It occurred to me, that I could combine these two interests I had, first since I was nine years old, that I could get eight prominent African Americans and I would trace their ancestry back to slavery. And then when the paper trail disappeared, which inevitably it does for anybody, I would do their DNA to see what ethnic group they were from in Africa. And ladies and gentlemen, it was such, it was a revelation, it was a gift from God. I mean, I did not have that idea when I walked in that bathroom. And I knew it was such a good idea. I stood there, tears, tears ran down, down, ran down my face. And um, I went back to bed. I couldn't sleep. Um, and the next day, I called Quincy Jones. Quincy was a friend. Rashida Jones was my student at Harvard. And Quincy had introduced me to Alex Haley because Quincy scored the music for Roots. And Quincy, being a jazz musician, sits up all night. So you can't do business with Quincy until 3 o'clock in the afternoon, right? So I waited till 3 o'clock impatiently, and I called Quincy, and this person answered the phone. I said, can I speak to Quincy? And finally, Quincy, I'm on the phone, and I said, Q, what if I could do for you what Alex did for himself? And Quincy said, does it hurt? <laughs> and I lied. I said, No. <laughs> He said, I said, would you be, if I could raise the money, would you be in the documentary? Because I was inventing this idea. There was no precedent for this. And he goes, yeah. Now, I wanted Quincy because he's a friend and he's Quincy Jones. But I also wanted him because, and remember, he was the first person I asked, who is Quincy Jones' best friend? Anybody know? No. No, but he and Ray, he and Ray Charles grew up in Seattle together. And Ray was in his first band. But no, his best friend, Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> now, why did I want Oprah Winfrey to be in my series? <laughs> Maybe because I had to raise six million dollars. <laughs> so, but you know, I was I was cool. You know, Quincy was on the line. He said that he would do it right. 
So I didn't want to be vulgar. <laughs> so I asked him how his girlfriend was doing, how the kids were doing. You know, I must have killed at least 60 seconds. <laughs> and then I said, Q, would you ask over? And he said, no. <laughs> but he said, I'll do you one better. I'll give you Oprah's secret name and address. And I said, well, I'm supposed to do that. He said, write her letter, dummy. <laughs> Snail mail letter. And I said, okay. And I thought, man, I've gotten a brush up uh, in my life, but this is cold. Quits in my boy, right? <laughs> so I went to bed and I thought, uh, it's not going to happen. But the next day I woke up, I sat down, wrote that letter, put it in the mail, Harvard Square, post office, my son. Six months, ladies and gentlemen, uh, come and go, no open letter. So, you know, I figured it's toast. It wasn't meant to be. So I'm, every Sunday during football season, I grade my student papers. My graduate seminar, kids have a weekly grade. <laughs> and I love watching NFL. I turn on at noontime, pregame, turn it off at 11 o'clock whenever the game ends. So I'm sitting there grading papers. And my cell phone rings and it's, it's Quincy. So I go, Q, what's up? And a deep woman's voice said, Dr. Gates, this is Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> <laughs> my students, I knew that um, it was good news. You know why? Because rich people don't call you with bad news. <laughs> if her assistant assistant had called me, she would say, Miss Winfrey got your letter, and no. <laughs> and she said she would be honored to, to uh, be in the series. So, my whole pitch you know, now I get part of my funding for PBS, and then I'm, I have corporate sponsors and individuals. But this is 2006, and I was inventing the genre. So I had no support from PBS or anybody else. And I had to go and pitch. So Johnson & Johnson was the first company uh, that I pitched. The whole pitch was, how would you like uh, the whole world uh, how would you like your product associated with the whole world learning what ethnic group Oprah Winfrey essentials? <laughs> you see that ceiling, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Imagine that that ceiling, opened, that ceiling opened up and a giant ATM slowly. <laughs> and that's how the series was born. That's the whole story. It's beautiful. Well, that was a really rich uh, journey you took us on. There's a, there's a lot to unpack, uh, but um, let's hone in on something I think that we all will share in some regard in, in your experience with scrapbooking and uh, when your, your, your grandfather, my grandfather did the same thing. Uh, he, you know, he, he had this um, in this bookcase. He just had this uh, these group of scrapbooks and just everything: newspaper clippings, old photos from him and my grandmother and my father. And he just, you know, he did a lot of the same things that you, you know, you said that your grandfather did. So when we talk about the success of finding your roots, as you know, as a, as a show and, and, and what has really resonated, it's, it, it goes back to what we were saying initially, is that, you know, there's, we think about family histories and we think about um, traditions and keeping track of our history and people in our families who were, what's the word you use, es esteemable? Estimable. Estimable. Yes. Okay. Estimable. Yeah. And, uh, and so we all had someone in, in our families who were estimable. Yeah. And so I think that there, there's a connection there for us. Um, so you had a lot of things to fall your way, the, your relationship with Quincy, who gave you, you know, opened it up for, for Oprah. But did you think it was going to be the success that it's turned out to be, though? No, I thought, first of all, I only when I invented it, it was called African American Lives. Mm -hmm. See, it's had three iterations. Two seasons, African-American lives. 
Then I got a letter. So it, so it premiered, and it was a hit. So PBS said, okay, why don't you do a sequel? So the first one I had, Oprah, Quincy, Chris Tucker, T.D. Jakes, my homeboy from West Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, Mae Jemison, the first fe black female astronaut, one of my classmates from Yale, um, a pre-med guy. I always forget his name. He was a very nerdy. Uh, <laughs> when he went to parties, you know, he didn't really hang out, didn't like to dance much. Uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, yeah, Ben Carson. <laughs> I go to Black Barbershop, right? And, which I love. Now the Black Barbershop <laughs> since COVID comes to me. But, <laughs> but I love Black Barbershop. And when uh, African American lives there, and they saw Ben in it, the brother said, uh, Brother Gates, uh, he's one of your friends. I said, well, we, we were boys. You know, we were classmates at Yale. And I said, yeah, you knew him before he breathed all that heat. <laughs> Well, let me make it clear. Uh, I don't choose my friends by their ideology. And I think that is a disgusting thing. And that uh, the, the politicization of the, even the idea of a friendship in America disgusts me. That we are, you are all intelligent people. You have a right to be Republicans, Democrat, Independent. We have the right to disagree with each other without being canceled or happy. <laughs> at Harvard, and it's about the debates that black people have had since the 18th century about what it means to be black in America. And I do that so all the kids know there never was one way to be black. There never was one way to be black. And in my last lecture, I say, there's one thing you remember from this class, one thing to take with you, um, and that is that there are 42 main African Americans, and that means there are 42 million ways to be black. Never let a bully tell you what to think or what to believe. And I <laughs> so I had to do a sequel to African American Lives. So I thought it would just go on, you know, African American, African -American Lives 3, 4, whatever. So who did I get for African American Lives 2? Maya Angelou is a good friend of mine. Uh, Morgan Freeman, anybody plays God and the president. You got <laughs> Chris Rock. Uh, Tina Turner, because I haven't had a thing for Tina Turner since I was. <laughs> I flew to Dace in France uh, to do her DNA. No, wow. <laughs> and that was a big hit. So then I got this letter. I started getting letters from uh, people. And now I get letters every day. I mean, thousands. You know. Every year, we get thousands of them. Um, and a Russian Jewish lady, a lady who identified herself as being of Russian Jewish descent. Dear Dr. Gates, I've always admired your stances on cultural pluralism and multiculturalism. But having watched two seasons of African American Lives, I've decided you're a big fat racist. <laughs> you don't do white people. Why don't you do a Jewish person like me? And I was so shocked. Um, and then I thought, you know, my whole brand is where is blackness, right? I'm a professor of African and African American studies. Um, and it never occurred to me to uh, even think about doing white people's DNA. <laughs> so by this time, Coca-Cola had become a sponsor. And my executive at Coca-Cola was an African American woman named Ingrid Saunders Jones, a very good friend of mine. She was president of the Coke Foundation. So I, I just kept thinking about this letter. And I thought, well, let me run this by Ingrid. So I called Ingrid on her cell phone. And I said, Ingrid, I'm uh, holding a letter from this Jewish lady who says I'm a racist because we don't do Jewish people, white people. She goes, what? And I said, I'm Jewish now. And she got up and walked down the hall. Now, I didn't know that she got, got up and walked down the hall. It's, the phone just went. She said, just a minute. And I waited, but there was... You know, it was silent. So I said, Ingrid? 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 And I thought the call had dropped, right? But what I didn't know is she had been in a, a, a room with other Coca Cola executives. They were all white. And she did not want them to hear this conversation. 
Well, she walked all the way down the corridor. And I'm shouting, Ingrid, and I'm about ready to hang up and call back. And she goes, no, Skip, don't hang up, don't hang up. Like, she said, I've been I'm with all these white people. They can, they can <laughs> and I said, well, Ingrid, what am I supposed to do when I tell this lady? She said, well, Skip, I only have one thing. <laughs> I only have one thing to say to you. And I said, what? And she said, there are a lot more white people drinking Coke than black people. <laughs> I took that as a yes. <laughs> so we changed the brand. I mean, as they say in the marketing, we changed the brand. And uh, so then I had the problem, Potento, I had to then pick white people. I'm really good at picking white people, but I didn't know how to pick white people. And then I thought, well, what about not only white people, what about Asian people, Latino people? There's all kind of people out there. Funny. So I said, well, hello. I needed a principal. So I turned to the Bible. And I did what Noah would do. Two Jews, two Catholics. <laughs> two Asians. I am Yo-Yo Ma, Christy Gabaguchi. Uh, Meryl Streep, just because I love Meryl Streep. She was in, uh, she was in her own category. Um, Stephen Colbert. I, I admire him. I think he's a genius. And anyway, it, it was called Faces of America. And big hit. So then somebody threatened to sue us because they said they had the name Faces of America. You can't sue someone for a title. You can't copyright a title. Uh, but we, PBS said, look, we don't want to fight these people. So pick a new name. And I just thought about it, finding your roots. And now season eight just finished. <laughs> so to answer your question, no, I did not know it would have the popularity that it would have. And I, people ask me, why do you think it's so popular? The reason, and you hinted, hinted at that, I think, um, our society is so riven, so there's so many divisive forces that the two subliminal messages every week for Finding Your Roots are that America is a nation of immigrants. Our African ancestors didn't come here willingly, but they came here from elsewhere. And even the Native Americans, their ancestors are immigrants. They came here 15,000 years ago across the Bering Strait and kept migrating all the way down the, the West Coast, of Mexico, Central America, and all the way down South America. Martin Luther King gave a great commencement address at Stanford in which he said, America is a nation of exile. We are a nation of immigrants. Yes. Please take a cotton swab from the drawer. Gently rub it on the inside of your cheek, then place it in the slot. Your DNA will be processed exclusively here at the Greenwood Center for Cultural Heritage. Only survivors of the 1921 Tulsa Massacre and their direct descendants are eligible to apply at this facility. Please tell us the best number to call you. 539-176-2442. Thank you. Our country. No code. So you can be Donald Duck or you know, Herman Munster, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, to protect their privacy. So she called and she said, Todd Smith's mother was adopted. I said, really? She said, yeah, in 1947, she was adopted. And she does not know. And I go, well, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> and she said, so we worked out this protocol, which I keep in a vanilla folder, file folder. And so I called him. I texted him. Because I said, you know, we have a relationship. He was on the set of NCIS. And I said, Todd, I need to talk to you about something. So I'll call you in five minutes. So he called and I said, Todd, I don't know how to tell you this, so I'm just going to plunge in. I said, you know, you're my boy. I really admire you. He said, yeah, I did this time. I said, well, your mother was adopted in 1947. 
he went crazy. I mean, he was really, he said, what? I said, your mother was adopted in 1957. Are you talking about that? Because his mother and, and father had a stormy relationship, and one night, his father shot his mother. And she survived, but they obviously moved out of the moved back, moved back in with her parents. And so he looked upon his grandfather almost like father. And he's, uh, he wrote a book and talked about the role that his grandparents played in his life. And in his big video, first video, uh, Mama, I'm going to knock you out. His grandmother comes down the stairs. He's in the boxing room. And his grandmother comes out the stairs at the end and says, Todd, take the garbage out. You know, it's really funny if you know that was his name. <laughs> and um, so he just couldn't believe it. So he yelled at me and he cussed me out. And he said, well, what the, am I supposed to do? <laughs> and I said, well, are you, you know, he said, are you sure? Are you sure? I said, I'm sure, Todd. I'm absolutely sure. And he said, that's impossible. What am I supposed to do? And he was really angry. And I said, well, if I were you, I'd call your mother. <laughs> and I hung up. <laughs> and I thought, God, this is terrible. I, I mean, I really did. I didn't know if I'd done the right thing. I didn't know if I'd use the right language. Uh, if I'm going to say my phone rang and it was Todd, I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> I said, God, he's going to yell at me. And I said, did you talk to your mother? And he said, yeah. I said, what'd she say? She said, is it possible that my father is my father, but my mother is not my mother? That meant that she had a suspicion. Oh, wow. And I said, why'd you ask that? And it turned out, when she was 12, her aunt had a baby. And all the women are in the parlor. And Todd's mother said, when I grow up, I want to have a baby that's just like that. And the evil aunt said, honey, that's not possible. And that night she went to her mother and said, Mama, am I adopted? And, she, and her mother said, No. She asked her mother three times, including on her deathbed. And her mother said, No, you're not adopted. You're my baby. But she was adopted. She was adopted in New York City in 1947. We found her original name. We found the name of her mother. And we found her mother at the age of 88 living in a nursing home. Wow. So my producer's called. Sorry, my allergies are kicking my butt here. So, my, my producer called, we tracked out the guardian of Todd's biological grandmother. And um, he said, Look, we have something delicate to tell you, but your grandmother had a baby when she was out of 19, making that up, I can't remember, in 1947, in New York She put it up for another. And what are you going to do with that now? She said, I'm going to call my grandmother and ask her for sure. So she called her grandma and said, Grandma, the skip king said that you had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> she said, did you? She goes, no, it was my sister who had the baby. <laughs> then she said, no, it was me. I had the baby. And then we re reunited Todd, his mother, and her mother. Wow. And, so, and they are all here. For Rachel, Cornel West is the best. So I doubt you've ever signed any other autographs like that, so maybe you just might remember. For many years, I've been very into my kids' genealogy mostly. Um, my side is 100% Jewish, a mix of Ashkenazi, Sephardic, and Mizrahi. But my kids' side is very multi-racial and multi-ethnic. And so a lot of Creole and stuff. So I, I actually, they're actually descendants of a king of the U tribe in Togo. Because this is such a new field of study, I found some programs that are genealogy programs, but I want to specifically go into genetic genealogy. So I'm wondering if there's any way you can help me get a mentor or somebody that could talk to me and help me uh, figure out what the steps are. I spend multiple hours a day, every day, on GEDmatch. 
Um, I love doing with dealing with the numbers and uh, plugging in the numbers and figuring out and going to the trees and and finding the correlations. And I found a lot of amazing I had a lot of amazing finds. So um, I would like some professional training. So. So that's where, um, what I'm hoping to be able to get some advice from you. So thank you very much. And I'm so glad you came to visit us in Arizona. Thank you, bye. What a great time. Uh, yes, you can uh, write to see some geologists at gmail.com because they're training programs more and more. This is so, so exciting uh, be, uh, because it's the only way that you can break the grid walls on one hand and if you want to go criminal, you're best in a different way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people, that excites them. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, other people are uneasy about that. So it's, it's kind of good. And it's always good to hear from uh, last from the past, right? Yeah, that was great. <laughs> so our next question is from an ASU student, contact student, Vera Tomomi. Which Finding Your Roots guest has had the most interesting background? But let's hear from Vera. Okay. Hi, my name is Farah Tohami, and I'm a student here at ASU's Cronkite School. It's an honor to have this opportunity to ask you a question, Dr. Gates. I was just wondering, out of all the celebrities, artists, and activists you've got to meet and interview throughout your career, who has had the most interesting background? Well, I couldn't have. That's like you're picking up on your children, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have never had a bad interview. We've done over 200 people easily. And, uh, but I, I mean, I have. Stories that resonate for me, the, the uh, Hello Puja story, you know, is very moving for me. George R. R. Martin, who wrote the novels that um, Game of Thrones uh, was based on, is a fascinating story. George, an Irish grandmother, and she uh, married an Italian guy. They went to school together, right? I call that an interracial Catholic marriage, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he cheated on her. She, he ran away. The young woman moved to Florida, and so that was her story. And you know, she she suffered. She died out on that because she was she was betrayed. So we go to Santa Fe, where George lives, and um, we do his whole family tree, and then I give him his DNA. And I have people read out their DNA percentages. Remember, this is your percentage of. Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry or Irish ancestry or French or whatever back 500 years. So he reads it. And I said, George, read it again. What's missing? And he looks at it and he says, there's no Italian ancestry. And I said, George, what's there that shouldn't be? He said, I'm 25% Jewish. I said, George, your grandma had an affair with a Jewish guy. Your grandmother cheated on her husband, not the other way around. <laughs> and then, tracked down the, the Italian guy in Florida and did um, his descendants uh, DNA. There's, he has no connection to George Wilde. It was completely uh, a fiction. She made it up. She made it up. And if you read that profile I mentioned of C.C. Moore in the New Yorker from December, she we knew from DNA that uh, his grandmother had an affair with the Jewish guy. But she hadn't found, when we filmed, she hadn't found the name of the Jewish guy. When the guy at the New Yorker was writing the piece, she went on the website and somebody, you, you know, it, it's all dependent on you all taking DNA tests, right? So somebody connected has to speak with Jesse. And then it shows up. And she was with the reporter. And she goes, yeah, the George R. 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 George R. R. Moore story, it haunts me. Because I know the guy's out there, but we haven't found him. She goes, oh, my God, I found him. She found the identity of the guy right there in front of the, of the New York reporter. And got George on the phone, and now he knows the name of his Jewish, uh, great, uh, his Jewish grandfather. Isn't that amazing? Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yes. So